Amen. Well, good evening to you tonight. Uh, it's so good to be uh, back here, and um, it has gone by really quick. Uh, I can barely believe that it's Wednesday night, uh, but here we are, Wednesday night, and uh, I am just so thrilled at uh, the warmth and the reception, the welcome that we have received from uh, this church, the precious people called Macon Baptist Church, and I'm just, uh, I've just felt such, um, so much of the spirit of, of Jesus here, and uh, I'm just so thrilled uh, about that. Uh, now, you've been getting to know me a little bit uh, as I've been preaching and uh, fellowshipping with you over the last few days, and uh, most of you know that, uh, that I am, you know, a Carolina Tar Heel fan, and and I told somebody, uh, I told, now wait, 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 wait. I told somebody yesterday, I said, I'm going to have to lay off those college basketball illustrations. I don't know if they're going to receive uh, God's word if I continue like that. Well, somebody does love me in here. I, I did get a, a, a decal, I think, to put on my car. <laughs> Left on the, the pulpit. I don't know if you were trying to make your way to the, I mean, uh, it was uh, to the pulpit, right, that's right. Now, I, I, I have, you know, a mouthful of words I could say about that, but I preached a sermon uh, last night about being, uh, not having a mouthful of words, and, or actually the night before last, and so centered on Jesus, focused on others, right? So the uh, Bible does say to love your enemies, so I'm going to do that tonight. <laughs> well, if you will, uh, please take your copy of God's Word and turn with me back to the book of James. Tonight we're going to be back in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, and tonight we're going to be specifically looking at verses 22 through 27, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 27, we're going to be focusing on that, but I want to read verses 19, 20, and 21 again, as you're turning there in your copy of God's Word, we've been talking about how revival is a work of God's Holy Spirit, it is His work, He is the one who brings it. Uh, it is His extraordinary act for His people, uh, but we've been noticing and learning that God has ordained ordinary means through which He will accomplish His extraordinary works, and those ordinary means are simply being humble before Him, praying to Him, and then it is largely dependent upon our response to God's Word. And so we've seen so far from the book of James, James that we are to listen to God's Word and then last night we saw that we are to believe God's Word, and tonight we want to look at James 1, verses 22 through 27, where we see where we can position ourselves for revival if we obey God's Word. So when you have found your place there in your copy of God's Word, if you are able, I invite you to stand with me in reverence for the reading of God's perfect Word. James chapter 1, let's read beginning in verse 19, all the way down through the end of the chapter, verse 27. This is the brother of Jesus, we believe, and here the word of God to us says, beginning in verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, humility, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, well, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, well, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction 
and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. Oh God, it is light. It is light to our darkened hearts. It is life for the deadness in our souls. Oh God, tonight your word is sweet. Sweeter than, than the honeycomb and the drippings of the honeycomb, the psalmist said. Your word is rich, much finer than gold. God, tonight I pray that we would recognize what we just heard. And Lord, that we would humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that we would yield to your Holy Spirit, and God, that we would surrender to your word. God, tonight that you would open these ears that we have, these ears that hear, Lord, that you would open these eyes that we have, these eyes that see. Oh, Lord, that you would uh, do away with all distractions here tonight, that you would guard us from the enemy, the devil. Lord, that you would keep all demonic influence out of here so that we might have a singular devotion to you. And God, I pray tonight that you would help us to understand that true Christians are those who not merely listen to your word, but Lord, out of a genuine faith, obey Your Word. I pray, Father God, that You would help us to position ourselves to continue experiencing the flame of revival, that it would continue burning tonight and far after we are done here. And so, Lord, I pray You fill me with Your Holy Spirit. God, that You would fill me up in order to pour me out in service to You and to the people who are gathered here. May You be glorified, Your will and your way be accomplished tonight. We ask and pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And together God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'll start out tonight with a question, and that is, um, anybody in here ever gone to college? Not Maybe not graduated, but maybe just took a college course. Anybody at all? A lot of us here, right? Okay. Interesting thing about college that, uh, that I discovered once I became a, a college student um, is that there is this, this thing that you can do in college that's called auditing a course. Anybody know what it means to audit a course? All right, maybe, maybe yes, no, okay. So auditing a course is very interesting. Um, when you're in uh, elementary school and middle school or high school, you really don't have a, a lot of say-so over um, what you do in your classes. You know, you, your schedule is already planned for you. You, you know when the teachers are going to tell you to go from here to there and the subjects that you have to study. That's kind of all chosen for you. By the time you get to high school, you kind of have some freedom to, to choose here or there. But when you get to college, you have a lot of freedom. You can choose whatever... Um, program that you want to study, whatever degree you want to pursue, and, and you have a whole lot of freedom. And one of the freedoms uh, in college is the, the freedom to take uh, an audited course. And what that means is, is that uh, you, you sign up for a course and you don't have to pay full tuition. And so if a class costs $2,000, this is typically like 100 bucks. So you pay $100 and, and you get to go to every single class. You get to listen to every single lecture. And get this, you don't have to do any work. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to study outside of class. You don't have to do any of the reading outside of class. You don't have to study for any of the tests. You don't have to take any quizzes. You don't have to take any exams. You don't have to write any papers. You just show up to listen, if, even if you want to. You don't even have to. But you show up to listen to the professor, and then you walk away, and you're not held accountable for anything. Now, there are a lot of young people here tonight, and y'all, some of them are shaking your head. That's what I'm going to do through college, right? <laughs> well, it's not that simple, right? Uh, you don't get any college credit for it. Uh, you just, if there's something that kind of uh, you have an interest in. So in, in my college years, I had an interest in some other subjects, and I said, well, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. But I wasn't held accountable for uh, any of the tests, any of the notes, anything like, like that. And so... Uh, what is required of you is very little at all. You just show up and you just listen to what the professor has to say. That's what it means 
to audit a class. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what does auditing a college course have to do with what James just said here in his word? And I'll tell you what it has to do with it. I am afraid that in Christianity, particularly here in America, and especially here in the South, that on any given Sunday morning or Wednesday night or Sunday night, there are people sitting in the pew who are auditing God's Word. They're showing up and they're listening to what's being said, but they don't think that they are held accountable for it. Uh, they don't think that they have a responsibility to, to then act on what they are listening to. Uh, there are very few things that will keep me up at night but one of the things that will give me a sleepless night is the fact that there are so many people who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ that may show up every Sunday to listen to the preaching of God's Word, and yet they walk away unchanged, not having a sense of obligation to act on what they just heard. One commentator put it like this to draw the connection between a, a auditing a college course and and listening to God's Word without doing anything about it. He said it like this. He says, The mere listener here in this passage reminds me of one who audits a college class. He attends and presumably he listens, but he pays a lot less, and he's not required to do any outside study to write any papers or take any tests. In other words, he is not held accountable for what he hears. It costs him not much at all, but he gets a lot less out of it, and tragically... Many church pews are filled with auditors on any given Sunday. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. That could not be, that concept of saying that you can be a Christian and simply listen to what the Bible says but not believe it and then act on it could not be any further from the truth. It is a lie. All throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the Bible explains to us that to be a listener of God's Word should, should be followed by acting on His Word. And especially in the New Testament, this is an emphatic theme all the way throughout. Listen to the way Jesus put it at the end of His most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the way that He ends that sermon, the way He gives an invitation, if you will, uh, is by saying this, Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27. Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine, and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. The rock here is someone who listens to God's word and then does God's word. But then Jesus goes on to say, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, well, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus is saying the difference between a true follower of his and a false follower of his comes down to whether or not you are obeying what Jesus said. And this is all over the Bible. Uh, listen to the way the Apostle John put it in, in the Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Before he, he tells us about the revelation that he had of Jesus Christ. He says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and then who keep. The, uh, then who do, then who obey what is written in this prophecy, for the time is near. Jesus put it like this in Luke 8, 21. He says, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. In other words, to be in the family of God, uh, character, what characterizes a person who is in the family of God is one who listens to God's word and then does God's word. Jesus said this all over the place. Listen to what he said in Luke eleven twenty eight. 28. He said simply, blessed are those who hear the word and keep it. Uh, Jesus said in John 13, 17, if you know these words I say to you, blessed are you if you do them. And then in perhaps the most provocative way to put it, uh, Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do what I tell you? Even in the Great, Com or the, uh, the great Commission uh, that most churches uh, form their mission around, 
uh, where Jesus tells us what our responsibility is as His people. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples. And what does it mean to make disciples? Uh, it, it means to make followers of Christ. What does that look like? They believe in Christ and He says, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what? Teach them to observe, obey, do all that I have commanded you. And that's what James is saying here. That we are not to be those who merely listen to God's Word, but those who live God's Word. That's exactly what James taught the Christians in his day. Uh, there in verse 22, he says, But be doers of the Word and not hearers only. And so tonight, what I believe God wants us to do is to come face to face with the reality that to be a true believer in Jesus Christ, to be a genuine follower of His means to not merely listen to His Word, but to live out His Word. And what I want us to do tonight is to examine our hearts, examine our lives to see whether we are living His Word out or not. Now, I know that from the outset here, it's very simple for us to step back and say, you know, of course I'm living the Word of God. I mean, I, I'm, I'm coming to church and, and I'm studying the Bible and I, I'm doing pretty good. But, but you see, the Bible doesn't want to just look at our lives in a general uh, way. The Bible wants to get very specific to the different areas of your life because it's possible that you could be listening to God's Word and doing what He says uh, in terms of gathering with the church, but you're not loving your wife the way you're supposed to. Uh, you're listening to God, but uh, you're not doing what He says when it comes to parenting. You're listening to God, but you're not doing what He says when it comes to sharing the gospel with the lost and, and dying world around you here in Macon. So we want to look at every aspect of our lives, every facet of our heart, to see if we are living God's Word in every area that he addresses. Now James here, he, he, the good preacher that he is, he gives us multiple ways to, to determine that. And I believe here in this passage, he gives us four different ways that we are to live God's Word out as believers in Jesus. Let me give those to you up front here, and then we will walk through them together. Number one, in verses 22 through 25, James tells us that we are to live God's Word consistently. We are to live it in a consistent way. Uh, number two, we see in verse 26 that Christians are to live God's Word controllably. We're to live it in a controlled way. Uh, number three, we see at the beginning of verse 27 uh, that true Christians, true followers of Christ are to live God's Word compassionately. And then fourth and finally, we find that Christians are to live God's Word cleanly. So these four ways that James tells us here, we're to live God's Word consistently, controllably, compassionately, and cleanly. And so as we walk through this passage together, open your heart to God's Word and let Him examine by the Holy Spirit. And where we see that we are not living His Word, uh, may He, by the power of His Spirit, help us to repent and bridge the gap. So number one, look with me there beginning in verse 22, as James tells us, that we are to be living God's Word consistently. He comes right out and says it there in verse 22. After he says uh, earlier in verse 19 that we are to be quick to hear, that is, hear God's Word, verse 22 says, but we are to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. But don't miss those two words there at the end of verse 22. He says, but be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You see, the interesting thing here that James is telling us is that it's not that some Christians uh, who are very mature learn to listen God's Word and, and then live God's Word. And then some of the more immature Christians over here, they, you know, they kind of listen to God's Word, but they just kind of live their own life. No, 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 no. No, James is saying that if you give in to the idea that you can be a listener of God's Word but not live His Word, then you have believed a lie. You, you, have, you have given in to a deceptive contradiction uh, it is a deceptive contradiction to believe that you can consistently live uh, or listen to God's Word and then it not change your life. Then you not do anything about it. James is saying that if you've given into that, then you have deceived yourself. 
Now James, as I said, being the good preacher that he is, he, he loves to give illustrations. And that's exactly what he does there, beginning in verse 23, to drive home what he's saying here. That we are to live God's Word in, uh, consistently. Uh, that our life matches up to what we are listening to. And the, the illustration here comes by way of imagery. And the imagery is what I like to call the forgetful mirror gazer. Know what he says, notice what he says there in verse 23. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, well, this is what he's like. He's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and then he goes away and at once he forgets what he looks like. Okay, so let me tell you right up front, James is looking for uh, an absurdity effect. When he's giving us this illustration, he wants, you to, he wants to provoke in you an emotion of, well, that's absurd, that, uh, that, that, that's ridiculous, well, nobody would do that. And the way he does it is by, by telling us about a forgetful mirror gazer. So let me just ask you this question here. How many of you today have looked in the mirror? This is one of those times that all the hands should go up, right? <laughs> okay? So you looked in the mirror today, right? Now, how many of you forgot? This is, it might be tricky here. How many of you forgot immediately? The moment you turned away, you immediately forgot what you looked like. And this is when no hands should go up, right? Nobody does that, right? You don't look in the mirror and then turn away and then forget what you just looked at. That, that doesn't happen, right? And so I looked in the mirror today two different times. Uh, and so when I woke up this morning, I got out of the bed and I looked in the mirror and I didn't, I didn't like what I saw, right? So what did I do? I turned away and as I turned away, I remembered what I looked like. My, my hair needed to be washed. I, I needed to, to get a shower. And so because I didn't forget about it, I went and did what I needed to do. And then later this afternoon, I, I got a workout in and I, I got real nasty and smelly again. And so I went in and I looked at myself in the mirror and said, well, I can't go to church like that. I've got to do something about it. So I had to turn around, and as soon as I turned around, I didn't forget what I looked like. I went and did what I needed to do. I got cleaned up. And that's what James is saying here. Nobody does that. And, and it would be more so in their day. Because notice what he says here. He says, if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in, in a mirror. Now, when you read the word mirror there in your New Testament, don't think about the mirrors that we have today. Because the mirrors that we have today weren't invented until centuries after the New Testament was written. When James is talking about a mirror here, he's talking about mirrors in the first century. And what those mirrors would have looked like, they would have been giant pieces of bronze or maybe copper. And they would be polished as much as they could be so that you could get somewhat of a depiction of what you looked like. So what that meant is, is if you wanted to know what you looked like in these days, you would have to stand there and intently look and look and look to get just a, a, a general idea of what your face and what your appearance looks like. Some people would have had to stand in front of the mirror for hours just to, to figure out what they looked like. And so these people would know what James is, is going for here. If you stand in front of a mirror for two hours, there's no way that you could forget what you looked like when you turned around. And so everybody in his audience would have known, well, that, James, that's just absurd. That's just ridiculous. Nobody does that. And then it's as if James says, exactly. So also, nobody can listen to God's Word and then not live God's Word and be a Christian. The same absurd emotion that we feel about someone looking in the mirror for two hours and then forgetting what they look like should be the, 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 the emotion that we feel when someone tells us, you know, yeah, I read the Bible a little bit, you know, here and there, but it doesn't really have anything to do with my life. It doesn't really impact my marriage. It doesn't really impact the way I spend my money. It doesn't really impact what I look at on the Internet. It doesn't really impact on, you know, what I, uh, I do with my smartphone. Yeah, this doesn't, no. James is saying, well, if that's the case, you don't know the Lord. Because that is a deceptive contradiction. And so what does James do here? Well, beginning in verse 25, he motivates us to obedience. Notice the way that he does it here. Verse 25, he says, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, 
being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, well, he will be blessed in his doing. Notice how James motivates us to obey God's word. He doesn't just say, hey, obey God's word. You know, this is the word of God. You need to obey it. No, listen to the tender way that he speaks to us about God's word. Yes, he does speak of it as a law or as an instruction, but notice the way that he, he modifies it. He says that we are to look into the perfect law, the law of liberty. And by looking into it and persevering in obeying it, it will bring about blessing for your life. So James says that, that this word here, this book, is perfect. God will not lead you astray. Everything that God tells you to do in this book is good and right and it's wholesome for your life. But then notice what he says. He says that, that this book here, uh, the law of the Lord, it will lead to liberty. I tell you, so many people have got it wrong when it comes to the Bible. So many people think that this big book here is one big giant book of rules. And so many people think that, you know, in order to be a Christian, you've got to read through, you know, this 2,000 page book here, and you've got to follow just all of those rules that are in there. If that's you tonight, if you think that this book is just a big book of rules and regulations and things that you've got to do and things that you don't have to do, let me just humbly tell you, you're wrong. That's not what this is. Now, now, now hear me. There are some rules in here. There are some commandments. But let me tell you something. This book is about God. This book is about how God loves me. This book is about how God sent His own Son into the world uh, to go to a cross to die for the sins of people as sinful as me. This Bible tells me about what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ and what that means for my life right now that He wants me to, to come into a saving and everlasting relationship with Him in which I can know Him and enjoy Him forever. That's what this book is about. And that's what James says it's about. It's the perfect law. God won't lead us astray. And it's the law that leads to liberty. It is a, a, a law that would lead us to a life of freedom. So many people think that if I'm going to become a Christian, it means that I'm going to be in shackles and chains to a, a harsh taskmaster and God is going to dictate my life in an authoritative and, and de, uh, a domineering way that's not going to be good for me. But oh brother, oh sister, oh friend, that's not who God is. Yes, God is going to have authority over your life. Yes, God's going to have dominion over your life. But it will be for your good. It will be to set you free from your sin. It will be to liberate you from loving yourself and forgetting about God and forgetting about other people. What does Psalm 19, 7 say that we've come back to over and over again over these last few days? The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. It brings life to those who will obey it. And Jesus Himself said in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Set you free. Free from sin. Free from the devil. Free from addiction. Free from being so focused on yourself and so centered on yourself. It will set you free from the eternal judgment that we deserve for our sin. By obeying this word, James says, it will lead to blessing for our lives. He says the one who looks into this book, this law of liberty, and acts on it, perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, what will happen to him? He'll be blessed in his doing, spiritually blessed, eternally blessed. I tell you, the more and more I obey the Lord, the more and more joy I experience. And I hope that you can say that tonight. There's some people that have come to me and say, you know, I'm just, I'm just not happy. You know, I just, don't, I just don't feel joy, you know. And I begin to go through their life and, and pretty soon it, it's pretty evident that they're not obeying the Lord. <laughs> They've got their own idea of, what, of how they can get happiness and how they can get joy. And they'll say, well, I, I need a new spouse, and that's how I'm going to be joyful. That's how I'm going to be happy. Uh, I need another job, and that's how I'm going to be happy. That's how I'm going to be joyful. Uh, I need this, or I need that. No, you need the Lord, and you need to obey Him. What's that old song say? What does it say? Trust and obey. 
For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to what? Trust and obey. This law leads to liberty and it leads to the blessing of happiness and joy. So the question is, why aren't you obeying the word? Why aren't you doing what God wants you to do? If it will bring this much joy, this much peace, uh, this much fruit into your life. That's why James says that we are to live the word of God consistently. But James is not finished. Oh, there are three more ways that we are to live God's word here. The second way that we are to live God's word is we are to live it controllably. And so you might be sitting there wondering, well, okay, if I'm to live God's word consistently, if what I'm listening to needs to match up with my life and, and I need to do what he's telling me to do, well, what does that look like? What is a life sold out to Christ, living for him? What does that look like? And the interesting thing here is that when James wants to begin talking to us specifically about what a life looks like that is lived for God, notice the first uh, area of your life that he goes to. He could have talked about anything. He could have said, uh, make sure that your heart is right before God. Uh, make sure what you look at with your eyes, uh, it, it's looking in the right direction. Uh, make sure uh, wherever you, you go with your feet that you're going in the right direction. Uh, with your mind, make, make sure that you're doing uh, what you need to do with your mind. But he doesn't touch on any of those things. When James wants to tell us what a life looks like, lived in obedience to God, do you want to know where he goes? He goes right to this little thing right here. To the mouth. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, he says, well, this person's religion is worthless. Again, you have to notice something here about the word religion. In our culture, and especially in our Christian culture, Religion gets a bad rap and people say, well, you know, I, I don't need a religion. I need a relationship with the Lord and that kind of thing. I understand that. But when, when the Bible uses the word religion, it uses it in two different ways. There's true religion and there's false religion. Uh, there is damnable religion and then there is genuine religion. And what James is speaking about here is, is, is having a religion that is true and genuine uh, that does entail a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ look like? It looks like someone who can control their tongue. Now, why would James go to the tongue out of all the members of our body when he wants to tell us how to live godly, how to live a Christ-like life? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because whatever comes out of your mouth comes from where? Right here in the heart. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 34, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come false witness and slander. Uh, you see, it's whatever comes out of your mouth, it, if it's not wholesome, if it's not right, if it's not godly, if it's not Christ-like, it doesn't so much mean that you have a problem with your mouth. It means you have a problem with your heart. Uh, your heart is not set on Jesus to be centered on Him and focused on other things. People. Jesus took so seriously the sins of the mouth that he said this in Matthew 12, 37. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. In other words, at the day of judgment when you stand before God, all God will need in order to know whether you were saved or not is what you said with your mouth. Oh, doesn't that just make us want to... Close that mouth, right? Jesus said, there in Matthew 12 again, that you will give an account for every careless word you speak. Every careless word that you speak out of your mouth. Every careless word that you text in a text message. Every careless word that you post on Facebook. Every careless word that you tweet on Twitter. Every careless word that you put out there on your Instagram. Every careless word we will have to stand before Jesus in judgment and give an account for every bit of it. And so James tells us that to live a life of, of, of obedience to God's word, well, it, it looks like having your mouth under control. And so the Bible has so much to tell us about the tongue 
and what we are to do with this tongue. But the, probably my favorite verse in all of the Bible when it comes to how we are to use our mouths when it comes to glorifying God is Ephesians 4.29. Really, if, if you want to know how to use your mouth, uh, if you just read Ephesians 4.29, this sums it up here. Paul says this, he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. In other words, we are to speak the right words for the right reason, with the right motivation, at the right time, to the right people. The Bible has so much to say about the tongue. And the word religion and unbridled tongue do not go together. And so we cannot claim to be a follower of Jesus if we gossip about people. If we create division by sins of the mouth, sowing discord. Do you know that God says in Proverbs chapter 6 that there are six things He hates and then the seventh is an abomination. And He lists these sins, these six sins. And then the seventh one, you know what it is? Uh, one who sows discord among brothers. It's not just that it's a sin, it's an abomination to God. It, it's put right up there with adultery, with homosexuality. Sins of the mouth are abominable to God. And yet, there are folks that would want to say that, bless God, I'm saved, but I'm using my mouth the way that I want to. We must live God's Word, not just consistently, but we must live it controllably. But James is not done yet. He says that not only are we supposed to live God's Word consistently, not only are we supposed to live God's Word controllably, but next there, at the beginning of verse 27, we are to live God's Word compassionately. Uh, he continues on with this theme of true religion here in verse 27. He says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. You notice, what, you notice the pattern here. It's not just about what you say. It's not just the, the fact that you say you believe in the Lord. It's what you do with God's Word. And James tells us that to live God's Word in a faithful way means that we will have compassion specifically on those who are helpless and weak and who cannot aid themselves. I'll tell you why this is the case. I'll tell you my own story. When I got saved, I'll tell you what I did. I began to read this Bible here, and I couldn't get enough of, of everything that God had to say to me. Uh, all, just all of my free time was just completely devoted and dedicated to, i got to read more, i got to read more. And as I read the Bible, I began to, to learn who God is. And I began to love about, about the, the, uh, the, the care and the compassion and the grace of, of, uh, of Him and, and how He exercises it toward people. And this is what I found out, that God has love for everyone, but as you read the Bible, you notice that God has a particular care for certain kinds of people. Did you know that? And the particular care that he has is for people who cannot help themselves. Uh, what I like to call them is the, the least, the last, and the lost. Uh, the poor. Uh, those who are outcasts of society. In Jesus' ministry, when he came into the world, those are the kinds of people that he was ministering to. Uh, he was going and sharing the gospel with prostitutes. He was going and, and, and speaking to the tax collectors, outcasts of society. He was speaking to those that, that the elite in their day would never speak to. He went after those who, who were low, those who were at rock bottom, and he ministered to them. And you see, as we learn, as we listen to God's Word and we learn about who He cares about, He expects us then to care about those same people. And that's why James says here that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and to visit the widows in their affliction. And so let me ask you, is that what you're doing? Because I'll tell you this, nobody else is going to be visiting those people. They won't be. Very few people in this world will be visiting and ministering to these kinds of people here. Do you want to know who should be leading the way? The church of Jesus Christ. you want to know why? Because He led the way in that direction. And one more thing I want to point out to you here. Notice that James doesn't address the pastors here. James doesn't say, now this is the pastor's job. 
Just, just, I'm just going to dump it all on the pastor. He's the one that's supposed to be running around and visiting all those that are the least, the last, and the lost. Not pastors are included, but he's addressing normal Christians here. Normal Christians are to visit those who cannot help themselves, to minister to them, to aid them, to provide for them, and to bring the presence of Jesus to them. We are to live God's Word compassionately. And then James brings us to the final way that he wants us to live the Word of God. And that is, we are not only to live His Word consistently, we're not only to live His Word controllably, we're not only to live His Word compassionately, but at the end of verse 27, he tells us that we are to live God's Word cleanly, in a clean way. We are to keep ourselves unstained from the world. Now let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. This doesn't mean that we are to run away from the world, isolate ourselves here in this sanctuary, and protect ourselves from the world. Say, we don't want to be stained by them. <laughs> A lot of sin out there. Don't bring it in here. We're just going to stay right here in our holy huddle, and we're just going to, we're going to do our thing. And no, 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 that's not what it's about. You see, Jesus in John 17 in His prayer to the Father, right before He went to the cross, the longest prayer that we have from Jesus, He prayed essentially that God would not take us out of the world, but that He would keep us in the world, but that we would not be of the world, right? That's in John 17, verse 15 specifically. He says, I don't, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but you keep them in the world and keep them set apart. Keep them set apart in the world. And God's going to do this through us. He's going to keep us sanctified, He's going to keep us unstained, but He's going to send us out there into the world. And as we go out into the world, we are to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ crucified and risen to those who desperately need to hear it, but all the while we are not to engage in the things that the world engages in. There might be some of you here tonight that in this very moment you don't believe that. In this very moment, there may be some of you who really think that it's okay for you to have one foot in the world and another foot over here in Christ. You see, that's not the way it works. You're either all the way in the world or you're all the way in Christ. There is no neutrality. You're either for Him or you are against Him. You cannot have half of the world and half of Jesus. You either have all of Jesus or you don't have any of Jesus. And as we become Christians, God doesn't take us out of the world, but He, he sanctifies us in the world and then sends us out into the world to reach the world. The way I like to put it is that when Jesus saves us, He doesn't take us out of the world. We all know that. That's why we're still here. But He begins this lifelong process of taking the world out of us. That's what happens. And as we are in the world, we are to... <laughs> to minister to those who are there, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. We are to live God's Word consistently, controllably, compassionately, and cleanly. Now friends, as we bring this time to a close here, I really want to drive this home to you. And if you haven't heard anything else in all of the services these past few days, I want you to listen up to this, okay? I want to share just a little story with you. It's a hypothetical story. Just to show you what it would be like for those of us here who say that, yeah, we'll just read the Bible, we'll listen to the preaching, but we'll just go live our life the way that we want to. Let's just say here, for, uh, for hypothetical sake, that, um, that our children, our precious children, Kyrie and Josiah, let's just fast forward a few years and say that Kyrie is about nine years old and Josiah is around six or seven years old. And one day I come home and, uh, and I just happen to go up to their rooms and I see that, uh, goodness, it looks like a hurricane has come through their rooms. It looks like that they have not cleaned uh, their rooms in, in years, you know. And so I look around and I'm displeased and I say, all right, Harris and Josiah, you come up here. I got something that, that I want you to do. And I tell them, I say, now look, uh, this is a disaster here and this is unacceptable. What I want you to do is I want you to take the next two hours. I want you to lock yourselves in your rooms and I want you to clean, and I want you to clean, and I want you to clean. I want you to get all your toys together. I want you to put all your school supplies up. I want you to make your beds. I want you to do all of this. And I, and I detail it for them very clearly and tell them exactly what I want them to do because I know it's best for them, right? 
And so they say, all right, we, uh, we understand, we've heard you, so now we're going to go and we're going to do it. So I go downstairs and I do my own thing for two hours and I hear them up there kind of rustling around and, and uh, two hours later they come back down and they've got their chest poked out and they, they say, uh, Daddy, hey, hey, come here. Uh, we, want you to, we want you to come up there and, and look at our room. Just, just uh, want you to see everything here. And so uh, I go up the steps and I go into the rooms and it still looks the same. It's still a mess everywhere. And I say, well, what have you been doing for two hours? Now, oh, let me tell you what we've been doing. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about this right here. Let me tell you what we've been doing. We've been memorizing every word that you spoke to us downstairs two hours ago. And look, 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 look. We even wrote it down right here. We wrote down all the instructions that you told us to do. And Daddy, look, we even, we even memorized it in Greek. We, we memorized it in Hebrew. Check all that out. Look at this. We, we listened to you, Daddy. We, we heard you crystal clearly. Here, here it is. How do you think I'm going to feel? I say, you missed the point, right? That's not what I wanted you to do. What did I want you to do? I wanted you to do what I said. And I fear, friends, that so often that's, that's the life that we're offering up to God. God, look at this. Look, look God, I, I memorized that verse. Oh, God, I, I know this one right here, and, and I can quote this one, and so-and-so asked me if I knew this one. I knew that one. Look at that, God. And God's not against Scripture memorization. We should definitely do that. But if that's all you do, you've missed the whole point. God wants us to believe Him, and He wants us to obey Him. We are not to be those who merely listen to God's Word, but those who live God's Word. And as I said on the first day of these revival meetings, friends, if we, if you, if you as a church made up of individuals who love the Lord, if you did all the stuff that you already know God has told you to do, there's no telling what He'll do in this community. There's no telling the people that will be saved, the people that will be encouraged, the people that will be built up, the people who will be reached and mobilized and sent out into the world for, for the sake of the gospel. I tell you, friends, we're really not lacking for, for more knowledge of the Bible. We already know quite a bit. In fact, we know more than, than, than most of the people of the world who are Christians. I've got like 13 Bibles. You know that? You probably have some, something similar in your house. There are people in China right now that only have one page of the Bible. But you want to know what? Those people in China, they're a lot more obedient than we are. You want to know why? Because they obey everything that they know on that one page. We've got about 2,000 pages here. I wonder how we're doing with what we know. God is not content with us listening to His Word. He wants us to live it. And if we do, if we obey Him... There's no telling what he'll do. We do know this, that Ephesians 3.20 says that he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask, all that we could imagine. May it be that Macon Baptist Church is raised up by God to listen to his word, to believe his word, and to obey his word, to see the fires of revival continue burning. May that be so. Let's turn that into a prayer. And let's offer it up to God and beg Him to answer it. Would you pray with me? Father, what a wonderful, wonderful word from You. And God, we thank You so much that You have told us very clearly, not just here in James, but God all over Your Word, that it is not enough for us to simply listen to what You say. It's not even enough for us to give an amen. If we're not going to get up and get out of these pews, and do what you tell us to do. So Lord, I pray. I pray that this church here would not see this sanctuary as a place where we can come and just hide from the world. But Lord, that we would see it as a springboard to catapult us out into the world. As we come here to get filled up with Your Word, prayed up and preached up, in order to be poured out in service to You, outside the walls of these church as we minister to those around us 
for the glory of Jesus Christ. Father, as, as Bobby comes here in just a few minutes to, to give an invitation, I pray, Lord, that You would move in our hearts. I trust, Lord, that Your Holy Spirit has already shown us where it is that there is a divide between listening and living Your Word. And God, I pray that every area where there is a gap, I pray that it will be exposed. And Lord, as You show us where we have fallen short, O oh God, that You would lead us to the cross where Jesus, Jesus, took our short fallings upon Himself. And where He died, He bled for our sins and rose again from the dead that we might not only be saved, but sent out into the world to be obedient to Your Word. Oh God, I pray that in this moment of invitation that You'd move in a mighty and powerful way and that lives would be changed here tonight, that we would leave from this place looking more like Jesus than what we did when we first got here. Have Your will and Your way now, God. We ask and pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, tonight we've had God's Word opened up to us. And as I look at this and I see that word invitational hymn, invitation, you're invited. It means uh, it's an action, it's something required on our part. You've been invited. You've been invited to the foot of the cross. I don't know where this message finds you at tonight. I don't know all the things that's going on in your world and in your life. But if there's something that's standing in your way, if there's something that's not allowing you to put Jesus Christ in the very center of your life, you're invited. You're invited to come and lay that down at the foot of the cross. Give it to the Lord. Give it to him. Let him have it. Let him, let him pick that thing up. Let him pick you up. You're invited. Our hymn of invitation tonight is found on page 448. Just a closer walk with thee. Won't, won't you stand and let's sing together. And won't you come. <laughs> 